My name is Sam Ashworth, and I'm a writer in Washington, D.C. I'm here to talk about how you can make writing a long-term project both more sustainable and more informed by spinning that project off into smaller things that you can pitch and publish to keep the whole project going. And so it's mostly low risk, right? So you, you only write the things if you pitch them and then are offered money for it. That's correct. You make sure that you have a publication that's already going to run it, that's already interested. And furthermore, it allows you to then tailor the pitches to those publications that dovetail with whatever it is you're working on. Um, this works not just for nonfiction projects or, or memoirs, but it works for novels. It can, I mean, heck, it can work for poetry collections if it's a more involved thing. So you have a book on a novel on submission now, right? Yeah, my novel is out on submission, and it's a pretty good example of how this works. It's called The Autopsy of August Sweeney, and it's about the life and death of a chef told through his autopsy. So my way of writing has, has a tendency to be very research intensive, almost to the point of parody, because <laughs> I happened to be writing this during graduate school, which meant I was able to secure a research grant to actually travel to France and work in a Michelin star kitchen. And when I say work, what I mean is stand in the back and pluck cilantro for three hours in a stretch. <laughs> and that job, I had worked in restaurants for much of my life, but I was in the front of the house. I'd been a bartender, I'd been a server, but I had never like applied heat to food. <laughs> and I didn't really get to do that in the restaurant either. Like once they let me blow towards something, but by and large, it was like peel potatoes, clean out the walk-in freezer, got get hypothermic in the walk-in freezer. <laughs> but the point of that was to learn what it was like to be a commis, uh, what's called a stagiaire, really, like a, a bottom of the totem pole cook, which is really where all cooks have to cut their teeth because the reality of the restaurant industry is that like the finest home cook in the world would be like a weeping wreck within 10 minutes on a saute line. Like <laughs> there, the skills are not interchangeable. Working in a restaurant is about learning how to work the kitchen. Like the kitchen is an organism and you have to learn how it works. And the only way to do it is from the very bottom up. And so that's how everyone starts. So that's what I needed to learn about. And when I secured the grant to do this, I think it was one of the first things I had ever pitched, as a matter of fact. Um, I didn't know anybody. And I looked up Eater. And Eater has a feature section. I was looking for someone who would do features. And so they had an info account. Like it's features at eater.com, I think is the is the account name. And I put together a pitch. And what I said was, I'm going to this place to do this. And what I would like to write about is the decline of French food as the zenith of Western cooking. Uh -huh. Right. For a hundred years, French food, like gourmet food was French food. And the French haven't really ever gotten over the fact that it's not anymore. At least that was my thinking going in. And that was sort of the pitch. And I wrote a long one. And part of the pitch was that I had secured my own funding. Um, so this isn't going to cost you anything aside from what you're going to pay me to write it. You don't have to fly me there. You don't have to pay me a per diem, nothing. So that was really important. Like I've written sub subsequently a couple of giant features for Eater. And I just pitched them one that was a big reach that would have involved them flying me to France. And they were like, we do not have the budget for that. Uh -huh. But then I got into a conversation with the executive editor. He was like, this is really interesting. Let's refine this pitch together. Because when you send a bigger pitch, and this is the difference between a bigger pitch and a smaller pitch. And we should dig into that distinction because they are important. Uh, a bigger feature is going to have to clear a bunch of hurdles. It's going to have to go through an editorial meeting. It's going to have to be budgeted out. There's probably going to be a contract attached to it. You may have to negotiate for payment. A smaller thing, it can go quickly. It doesn't need – an editor is much more comfortable signing off on a short piece. So what would qualify as long piece? What would probably qualify as short piece? Um, I would say a long piece is uh, 3,000 words and over depending on venue. Three, all right. So print 20,000 and over. Online, three, four thousand and more. So this piece wound up being mm, six thousand. The next one I did was for them was seven. And so ultimately we met. This was, you know, pre-pandemic when you met people. And he really helped refine the pitch because he, he had a much clearer sense of what an eater reader wanted. And so what was important was that I wasn't purely married to the pitch. It was more like I have this material, I have this opportunity, and I have this is an interesting take. 
And so it evolved steadily over the course of the project. And ultimately, the project, it took two years for that to see the light of day, owing in large part to um, editorial turnover and inertia and me starting to do a lot of yelling. <laughs> <laughs> I, got, I learned how to be really, um, let's say, aggressive in advocating for myself on that project. <laughs> okay, so they agree to do it and then, all right, so you, you do the experience and then you write about it and you turn it in. At that point, you know, how has the pitch changed? Like what did the the article or essay kind of become from there? The article changed completely because especially if you're going to go and do something that's an experience, like experiential journalism, which I really recommend trying, um, you have to be open to the experience changing the story. The story is the experience. Ultimately, you don't have to be utterly married to your pitch. It's not a thesis driven essay. You can go in with a question. What I wanted to say was like, what has been lost my first pitch was, I think, what has been lost with the disappearance of France as the prime mover in Western gourmet dining? That's interesting because I thought at first it was reliant on the take that it had to be the opinion. But so it's kind of like you have the idea for a take, but you you t spin it more into the question to write into. Yeah. And I guess it was the take was like the pretense that French cuisine has fallen behind or that it's not what it was. And the reality turned out to be very different on the ground, that France is radically rethinking itself and that it, what it actually turned into was what turned out to be really prescient, actually, because I guess this came out in like, I don't know, 2019, maybe 2018, 2019. What happened was it hit right before or around the time that Me, the Me Too movement began, because what the article wound up being all about was how the the way that French chefs are training has evolved. Like the really big thing that France exported wasn't its food. It was its training system. It was this militarized version of what a kitchen should look like. They literally call it a brigade. <laughs> and it is the French brigade is to restaurant food as the assembly line is to a car. And in fact, I think Auguste Escoffier publishes his big guide is like a Bible of this in the same year, I think that Henry Ford pioneers the assembly line. And that has been radically changing in, part, in large part because French cooks are no longer willing to accept being, you know, getting the shit kicked out of them <laughs> by them. chefs. There's this real rethinking that's happening and it informed the hell out of the book. I couldn't have done that part of the book without it. Right. So what kind of pitches were you able to make um, more related not to the experiential research, but more to like um, the reading, like stuff that you had just learned from, you know, the research in general. Have you been able to do that or has it all been mostly experiential things? Um, I would say that because this book was really built around these two experiences, because, you know, working in a kitchen is one thing, but going to do autopsies is another. <laughs> um, right. And those two I, I have a tendency to go to go long form. I like long form. Um, I didn't know what creative nonfiction was until graduate school. I never heard of it as a term, right. but I learned a lot about it. I, I and it, it's helped. So when I was going to do, go do the autopsies, and there was like one person in the country who would have let me into his lab to do this, and he did, and I got lucky. And in both cases, by the way, I went into the experience having already pitched the project. And what's really important about this is that I was transparent with the people I was working with who, who let me in. And I told them that I was going to do this. And that is incredibly important. Telling somebody if you want to go do something like it's easier actually to get access for a novel because you're then they're not really on the record. But if you are planning to use it in pitches for whatever purpose, you you have to inform the person you're doing it with unless you want to truly burn that bridge. And in fact, the restaurant I worked in, they didn't love what I wrote. Um, I, I had a the person who put me in contact with them actually said that uh, they feel they felt, quote, like I had spit in their soup. <laughs> wow. But at the same time, I got contacted by a woman. It, it wasn't nasty, but it, the kitchen was incredibly disorganized. Right. It was a small Michelin-starred kitchen in the south of France, and it was run by this woman who was 
a brilliant cook and had created an extraordinary place, but the, the place was chaotic. It was completely chaotic. They had plowed through like a different sous chef every year because she wouldn't let anyone do anything else. And so they knew that I was going to write this. And when it came time for, I wanted to interview her at the end. She never sat down with me and that is what it is. And in what happened was when it published, uh, a woman who is a, a, a chef who had actually staged there like right before or after me, who had worked like 11 Madison Park. And now she's sort of a high profile cook in New York. She reached out. She was like, holy shit, that is exactly what it was like. Uh, well, there you go. <laughs> so I felt very vindicated about that. Yeah. But with the autopsies, I had been working on and off with the Washington Post magazine for a while or had I had been trying to write a piece for them that got that died. And that happens sometimes. It died because I could not get the access I needed. But I had a contact with the editor and I said, look, hey, I'm I'm going to do this. Can I do a piece about this? She said, absolutely. Because the decline of autopsies in America is a huge problem. And I won't go into that here. I have right. written about it. <laughs> you can link to it. It's fine. Okay. But that article. So at that time I was able to sit down. It was that was like on pretty much on the record. That whole thing was on the record. And I was really lucky that I was able to do it. But without doing that, if I hadn't done that experience, I wouldn't, the book would never have happened. Right. So basically it's like a way to make you way better at writing the novel <laughs> so, so that it sells. And then while you're doing that to make money and pull in marketing and attention essentially for yourself and build credibility as the person who's writing this novel about food and autopsy. It absolutely built attention. And when I was, um, I got lucky with agents a little bit because I was introduced to one, the one who I'm now with, but at the exact same time, another agent um, read the autopsy article, which finally came out after three years. So one took two, the other took three. I had to pull it from the Washington Post, publish it in Elemental, rest in power, Elemental. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but an agent read that and it had happened multiple times that somebody would read it and reach out because I had great editors. And both editors said, make sure you mention your book. In the article or just? In the article. Mm. Usually because like, why would you do anything as stupid as this? Uh-huh. <laughs> because you're researching a book. Right. <laughs> um, and they made sure I put that in and people saw it and it did make a difference. Um, so and for me, I, I kind of see writing like as a way to learn cool things that I didn't know. I always thought like the coolest thing about being an actor was that they would go pay you to like learn dressage for six weeks or something. <laughs> yeah. Right. Or like, we're going to get like a, an elite boxer to teach you how to box. You're going to learn capoeira. Yeah. You're like a professional amateur. <laughs> yeah. Like Daniel Day Lewis learning how to like, sew a, a, a couture dress. Right. <laughs> that's cool as hell. Yeah. So that's how, that's sort of how I see it. Mm -hmm. So when you were picking the magazines for these, like Eater is obvious, right? Hey, food. So you go and look at the, the food magazines. Like that makes sense. Autopsy to me doesn't seem as obvious as where that would go. Do you, um, did you look more in like the popular, like slicks as they're called? Um, autopsies was interesting because uh, in that case, I had this contact I, like I had been working closely with this editor at the Washington Post magazine, which pays differently from the from the from the paper pays better. And they paid a at the time it was a dollar fifty a word for features. And I had been working for a while on the story about the DC Metro that ultimately went nowhere because Metro just stonewalled all of us. They're like, no. But she knew by that point that I could do the job, and so I told her this is what I want to do, and she said, yeah. Um, it was that like once you are. Once you're long, especially if it's not going to cost them stuff, like, again, they didn't have to send me there. Um, it's easier. So they were a natural location for it. And, and in that case, one thing that was really important, and it's I think it's an important thing to say, was that I became extremely passionate about the autopsy question. Like when I'd seen what I'd seen and when I understood how severe a problem it is, not just for for hospitals and for healthcare, but for families. The fact that autopsies simply are dying. Yeah. As late as 1960, 60% of deaths in hospitals were autopsied. Now the number is 4.3%. Like, oh, wow. I didn't it, know that. And in other, when COVID hit, this is my soapbox. I'm going to do it really fast. <laughs> yeah, please go when ahead. When COVID hit, 
I had assumed that because it started in China, that there would be um, a lot of pathological data. There would be a lot of autopsy data coming out. So we would learn how COVID affected the body. Turns out, no, because the autopsy is all but extinct in China Hmm. because nobody trains on it and nobody does it. Because it's a huge expense for – not a huge. It's actually a small expense for for hospitals. They cost like about $1,000, $1,200 each. But people don't request them and people don't know anything about them. And then when you – so as a result, it took months. COVID starts – we start hearing about it in January. Yeah. The first pathological data comes out in April hmm. showing how – without that, we don't know how it affects the human lungs. So that was – a very visible. And when I finally did publish the article, I had to go back and I had to redo the whole thing under the frame of COVID. So I had effectively had to pull the article from the Post magazine because the problem is if you have what's called an evergreen story, there's no urgency. In my case, the people literally were not getting any less dead or any more dead. Yeah. So why do they care to run it tomorrow when they could run it in five years? There's something else. It would get bumped and then they they wouldn't run it at the length that they agreed to. And I said, no, this is the one piece of writing I've done that I really care about people reading. I really need people to know this. And so I, I yanked it and I found a place that would put it up in full and they were on, they ran it at like 7,000 words ultimately. And it was terrific. And the pay was just as good as you were going to get mm-hmm. elsewhere. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you. So, I mean, well, for the France ring thing, you got the grant. So you asked the grant people for it, but like to get in the restaurant, like who did you contact? A uh, person I'd known a long time. And again, when you're starting, especially you go where you have access naturally. I really can't uh, stress that enough. So I had grown up part by spent part of my childhood in this part of France. I'm bilingual. Um, and I knew people who were very connected within the, the food world there. And so I asked somebody, like, do you know anyone running a restaurant who would be willing to take me on? And it turned out that that was essential because, as I found out, I had thought I had laid on to work in two places. Um, what I discovered when I got there was that France is so paperwork obsessed that I didn't have documents. I didn't have any kind of work visa. And the greatest fear in the French business world are the words, CDI un contrôle, which means if there's an inspection, <laughs> it strikes fear into their hearts. And so if somebody showed up and I wasn't documented, they would be busted. They would get stuck with a big fine. So these people took a flyer on me because this woman I'd known all my life vouched for me, which is why it was a little rough when they didn't love what I wrote. Right, right. But the subsequent places I was supposed to work were like, oh, actually, you can't you can't handle food here. You can stand in the corner for right. 15 hours. <laughs> but don't but touch you can't it. work. Which which wind up being okay. I like I had <laughs> I had done what I needed to do. Like so, you're not just like cold calling random places and be like, "Can I talk to the owner of this restaurant?" Hey, I'm a journalist or something um, or a novelist. I would do that now. Yeah, now you would. I would absolutely do that now. I would say you can look. You can look at my clippings. You can look what I've done. Because um, you have the portfolio. Yeah, and it's a. It is really hard for me now to like. I am now in the process of trying to because I'm working on a political book. And I am now trying to get with campaigns, gone back to the post and asked if I can, I want to write about trackers and advanced teams. And what I really want is access to a candidate. And I've had, I spoke to like Beto O'Rourke's uh, campaign manager from his run, his campaign. And he was like, yeah, I really love this project. There's no world in which I'm calling him to tell him to take your call. Right. <laughs> there's no way I'm doing that um, because there's no upside for him. Right. So, you know, this is a different level of access. That's an important thing to think about, too, is upside for the place. Exactly. Yeah. So when you present it, that is really a key part of it. Often people will do a lot for publicity. Um, And there are lots of ways to get in, but you do have to be persistent and you have to be willing to uh, lose your dignity a little bit. And then you have to not owe them too much. there, you do have to know going in that even if you don't consider yourself a journalist, even if you're writing them, but you want to do an essay about them instead, which is fine and great, you still have to abide by journalistic ethics, which means you have to be upfront going in. You cannot sandbag them after the fact, right? They can't say, I didn't realize you were going to write about this. Mm-hmm. Because if you do tell them, you make it clear, I will be writing about this. I am coming in here as a journalist. They'll kind of forget about it. You can't. Because 
you're going to write the story. And you're going to write the story as you see it. You're going to write the story that you feel is true. And what I've learned is there is a coldness that you have to have. Even if you're writing about someone you really admire, right? It's a positive story. But you have to admit that you can't just be a fluff piece. You can't do that. Right. I bet that's that's I bet that's really hard if you're doing a profile on someone. Like if Ooh. your journalism pitches a profile. Yeah. Because you can fall in love with someone real, e- <laughs> real easy and you want to please them because you came friends from all the time or something. And that's a great way to get ridiculed. Um, we are – Mercifully, it is the year 2022, and we, I think, have left forever in the rearview mirror the, like, 1990s era fawning Esquire profiles <laughs> where, like, a woman comes into a restaurant, like, born on a gossamer ray of sunshine, <laughs> and it's all about, like, the pout of her lips yeah. and the, like, strap that falls off her shoulder. Right. <laughs> and... We don't do that anymore. Now you look at the profiles that are being written. They're so much more commanding and serrated, even when it's somebody really cool. Right. Uh, and you know, there's people who do this so well. I guess is it more about making the three dimensional human in the piece now or is it something yeah. else? And yeah, it's about making them a three dimensional human, but it's also really about their relevance. Why we care. Why is this person of this moment why are they worth writing about? How do we interpret them? It, it's really much more, I think that's what profiles are these days. But for instance, I'm right now trying to put together a pitch for a really ambitious piece that would involve me being sent to France. So who knows if it'll happen. But the, I want to write about this extraordinary restaurant concept that's being created now. That, uh, like it's a revolution in how restaurant handles restaurants handle labor. And the woman, I've known the woman involved since college. Um, she reached out to me after one of those articles as well. And we reconnected. And she contacted me about this. She's like, oh, would you like to write about this? Do you want to be involved in this in any way? And I do think it's a really cool story. But I've had to lay down some ground rules. For one thing, she was like, you can stay in my you can stay in my house. I'll give you my apartment when I come, if you come. Which would cut the cost for any publication. And at first I was like, oh, that sounds great. Oh, no. Yeah, because mm-hmm. no, <laughs> no, you it's a, absolutely cannot do that. And it's, I've also had to tell her, I was like, look, if I write the story, if, like, if I get to do this, like I'm writing whatever happens. Right. And she understands that. But you had to be upfront with her. And so there's the very real possibility that she could fail. Right. That the article would be about a failure. Right. And explaining that and being transparent about that up front is a necessary component of building trust. But if you don't do it, the the publication won't trust you, right? The editor isn't going to be like, you're just trying to write a fluff piece about this person. Because, no, it's not what I want. I want her to succeed. But, I mean, if if it all blows up in her face, it's going to be a really good story, too. Mm-hmm. So is the experiential journalism, is, is that where most pitches you think are getting picked up? Or can you do like those op-eds? You know, have you ever done like an op-ed based on something you learned that didn't involve you going to the place? Um, it's a great question. Uh, so, so the first part, I can't say that experiential journalism is like where it's at. Mm-hmm. There's many ways um, to do this. And also, you know, some people, I, I'm happy with the long form stuff. Yeah. I do. But bear in mind, it takes months. Right. Months or and years. months and months. <laughs> years. But like one piece alone, I wrote this piece on the Chef Rocco de Spirito for Eater. It was supposed to be a 2000 word piece where I just watched the show, his old show from 2003 and went to his restaurant because he'd reemerged after 15 years. It turned it metastasized into a nine month project, 6,500 words. And I had to talk to everybody who was on that show. <laughs> and let me tell you, when you contact people who are on a reality, on a reality show from 2003 to ask them about it, they're like, how did you get this number? <laughs> right. So that those take a very long time to do, whereas other pieces you, know, you can you can do quicker pieces. There's so much else out there that doesn't require that kind of legwork, although it's harder to spin those into features and features do pay better. They flat out do. Um, do they actually pay remotely what the work was worth? <laughs> no. <laughs> right. No. The number of hours I spent on the phone for that piece about Rocco, absurd. Yeah. Then you asked about op-eds. And so I don't – I was about to say I don't write op-eds. But I have occasionally uh, 
gotten angry on the internet. <laughs> um, and those were like small. One piece I did for the rumpus, like I got super mad one day. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wrote a piece called uh, "Take the Phrase Judeo Christian Out of Your Mouth." <laughs> uh-huh. um, that would that would viral. That blew, like, I was super mad that yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that was great. I wrote that in a day and a half, and it got thrown up online. Yeah. And then recently, I uh, yelled about Streganona for Gawker, and that again was like I had an idea, and I wrote an editor, and I said this is bullshit. Let me do this. Yeah. And they're like, Ooh, a hard opinion. They're like, yeah, <laughs> we, we want to take, that. we want to take that Calabrian Chrome down a peg. <laughs> so let me ask you this. So all this going on while you're working on a novel. So how did you manage, you know, wanting to work on the novel, <laughs> want to, you know, wanting to get it done, wanting to get it on submission with the, um, with the very real demands of the journal long form journalism that you're doing. So when you're working on the journalism, like books aside, you're not worried about it. You're just kind of waiting to complete. And then you're like, okay, now I have this experience to kind of put into the book or are you toggling, you know, back and forth? Um, I'm toggling. And part of the key to that is that I am not relying on freelancing as my primary source of income. And that's really important. If I were a full-time freelancer, which is a thing that you can do and it can be successful at and, Um, if you are interested in that, uh, I highly recommend the writer's co-op podcast with a woman named uh, Wu Dan Yen and I can't remember the other one's name. Um, they are phenomenal at breaking down the the job of full-time freelancing. I don't do that. Um, and I don't do that because, um, I had other sources of income that simply paid better. I couldn't afford to be a a full timer. And so when I would work on these big projects, the novel would sit Right. or better yet, I would do the thing and then have a sort of a deadline deadlines help. And then the two of them cross fertilize. Often I would need to write the, the article about the autopsy and the kitchen. I had to work through those um, almost as proof of concept for the parts of the novel. I had to, the amount that I learned in doing them, um, I was then able to put it into the novel. And I remember before I went to the autopsy lab, I had been to anatomy labs. So I had seen dead bodies. I'd like looked into them. But anatomy labs where in medical schools are completely different. There's no resemblance, even in the bodies. They, have, they bear no resemblance to uh, a cadaver that's being autopsied. And I tried to remember, I wrote a scene. I wrote the opening scene. And then when I, five minutes into that lab, I knew everything I'd written was wrong. <laughs> Everything. Yeah, um, that's interesting. Book would never have happened, and now um, I'm encountering trouble because it's the descriptions are extremely accurate. Sometimes a little too much. So I've gotten the word squeamish back in responses from editors more than I had expected. Uh, but so that that is important. If I I don't see personally, I don't know how you uh, full time freelance and work on a long-term project. Most freelancers I know will take like leave to do book projects. They'll go on, right. They'll, they'll find money somewhere and they'll take time away. 